we've just turned the engine off and we've got about four and a half to five knots. Five and a half! We've got five and a half knots! Yoo-hoo! Come on, Liz, we're always waiting for you, aren't we? We've been ready for ages. Uh, Lindsay and Sharon very kindly picked us up because the four of us are off to the mud volcano today. We read up a little bit on it, I'm not sure what to expect. We were told to pack all sorts of things which we don't have. Long trousers, walking boots, um, what else? Expect leeches. Let's see what this is all about. can't not come to Borneo and discuss the darker side of deforestation and of course the ubiquitous palm plants. As you drive to this beautiful wildlife reserve you have to go through hours of palm oil plantations on either side including the new ones so there's a whole lot of terracing that's been done along the, uh, the scenery here. This is really quite unique actually driving into a palm plantation and that is exactly where we are now before we get to the nature reserve. At one section of the road it looks like a, a cemetery there's just stumps of beautiful old rainforest trees. It looks like a cemetery or a battlefield where those trees, they never stood a chance against this incessant desire to make more and more money from palm oil. Not all animals die and some animals do live in the palm oil plantations, but many more lived in the jungle before that. Most of the big mammals have gone. Lots of smaller, less glamorous animals, they no longer have a habitat. And we're ending up with this pointless, huge, marching army of palm oil plants all over this incredible island. It's an eye opener and it's really quite upsetting to be honest so we're hoping that the nature reserve will make up for it in some way the car stopped at the gates to the wildlife sanctuary and all of a sudden the palm oil stopped literally right on the gate and now we have rainforest well after a very bumpy ride through the palm plantations here we are finally at the Tabin Wildlife Resort and it's beautiful here. First thing we see are the little river huts. So they've got these stilted houses which are right by the river which you can rent out. This has already exceeded my expectations. I genuinely thought we were just going to be driving up to a hill with a crater with mud in it. I didn't realise there was this sophisticated setup here in the jungle. It, it's, it is amazing. I'm, I'm super impressed by it already and the fact that we saw that wildlife on the way up here is great. Anyway, Paul has explained that we're going to be driving first of all 15 minutes up towards uh, a trail. It's an elephant trail. Uh, because of the rain recently it's very muddy. My walking boots fell apart sadly. Fortunately they have Wellington boots uh, but we have to buy leech socks because there are leeches here of course. So they're nice uh, sexy looking socks that come up to the knees and we're going to be doing a trek for about uh, an hour, hour and a half or so and then we get to the mud volcano itself. Very nice reception with some lemongrass water and a cup of coffee. And now we're on our way to the beginning of the trek. It's supposed to be about an hour and a half. With me and Jamie, it'll be two and a half hours and a lot of groaning and moaning. <laughs> just, we just walk slow, okay? Be, um, be quiet, okay? Uh, you can talk, but not very loud uh, voice. We're going to walk into the jungle right now. Got our wellies on, <laughs> our leech socks. And the rules of the day are don't talk and don't touch. So most of it is from the um, bearded pig. Actually, it's different from the white boar. Bearded pig is actually endemic. You only can find it in, in Borneo, island, uh, island of Borneo. Uh, it's totally different from the peninsula of Malaysia. Bearded pig is in a big size, um, but they're very shy. They, when, there's, when there's a human around, they will just run off. Can you explain what this is, Paul? Uh, this is the, um, the caterpillar. Um, they call it stick caterpillar. Normally what they do, if there's a um, predator around, they play dead. Oh. So like now, he's playing dead. 
yeah, so that yeah, you pretend to be like uh, a stick. A stick. Yeah, but actually you can see that's the head at the front, that's the leg there. Wow. Nice, eh? I thought I was getting wet and now as we're crossing the Rhino River, I realised that there's a leak in my left shoe. I think that's a song. Anyway, this is the Rhino River because this is where the very last Borneo Rhino lived. They looked after her for a long time here. And in 2016, the vet decided that the tumour that he'd been monitoring had really taken over and she was in pain. So sadly, she had to be put down. And so now there are no more rhino here. And we were just talking to Paul, our guide, about the rhino here and asking him, frankly, why there are no more rhino. And of course, it's deforestation, the loss of habitat that has caused this. But also poaching, as he says, you know, they, they were prized for Chinese medicine. So that was one of the reasons they've gone. Very sad. What's really encouraging to hear Paul say, though, is that over the years, uh, there has been a move by the palm plantation owners whoa, to actually give back land, believe it or not. This is something that the government is encouraging them to do. And at the moment, there is a procedure in place to give at least 100 metres from the Kinabatang... Do you know, I still cannot say Kinabatangang River without thinking about it. Um, but to give back from the riverbanks 100 metres um, back to forest, because as we saw, some of those, especially from some of the drone shots, the palm plantations come right the way up to the river's edge. So this is really encouraging to hear that there is a move to reclaim some of this forest. Cut them a little bit of slack because they are now starting to understand that they must preserve the rainforests of Sabah. The guys have just stopped for the uh, orangutan nests. There's a few old, they're old nests, they're not used anymore, but uh, I can see one that looks like an eagle's nest. This is from the branch of the uh, Soraya tree, which an orangutan has chewed. Now, apparently the orangutans like chewing the inside of the branch. It contains medicinal properties and they most likely chew it when they're not feeling well. And here we're looking at orangutan teeth marks. That's where he's been biting into it. This is chewed up bark from an orangutan. Still really fresh. It's from this morning from a couple of hours ago. So we've seen nests. We've seen the bark that, that they've bitten and we found the chewed up bark as well. They're, they're here somewhere. Over your left shoulder, there's an ebony tree, which is really obvious because it's so dark. And over my left shoulder, there's also an ebony tree, which is very rare and it's protected now. The other one that's protected is ironwood. And ironwood is so strong and so thick, it grows one millimeter a year. And if you chop it with a very sharp ax and a lot of determination, put it in the water, it sinks apparently. We were asking Paul about logging and uh, most logging in Borneo, I think in Malaysia generally, is now illegal. Uh, there's a couple of trees they still allow to, to log, but they're softwood trees like the uh, Surya tree that we looked at earlier. That's a softwood and obviously it grows quickly so they're allowed to log for those. But the harder wood trees that Liz mentioned, the ebonies, the ironwoods, uh, those kind of trees, they're now all protected. So in theory, you shouldn't see any more logging in this area. Lindsay was saying he once saw 15 trucks driving to port, stacked full of sawn logs. And Paul explained that uh, this is possibly old logs that have been 
cut down, trees that have been cut down up to 10 years ago, they're actually very difficult to remove from the forest. So they're still clearing some of the older trees that uh, were cut down many, many years ago. Uh, we asked him if he believed this excuse, and he says, I have to believe it. Now, if you look at this tree, the big tree in front of us, you might notice along the trunk, you see the white thing that came out. That's the, um, the step uh, from the tree. We call it resin. Now, with that, you can create fire very easily. Local people, they believe that the smell from the smoke um, will make snakes mosquito fly run off they don't like the um, the smell mm -hmm. does it smell good it smells good actually yeah. um if you go to chinese temple it will be the same beautiful i want some <laughs> take mm. a drink yeah. mm. nice. aromatic incense mm -hmm. out of the jungle and into a clearing to the mud volcano now we're going to very quickly go up to the top here because it's hot you can already feel the heat for each step as we get closer to the uh, tip there. This is the famous mud volcano that we came to see. And uh, it's very hot, middle of the day, of course. And the volcano, when it was originally found, was flat. It was just a, uh, a flat area covered in mud. And gradually, over the years, as it erupts, every year it erupts at least once, it pushes up a whole load more mud. And it's now a hill and maybe in a million years time it will be a mountain so basically we're looking at a baby mountain here surrounded by rainforest it is utterly beautiful There we go. How exhilarating was that? The body is thanking us for doing some decent exercise. It's so good to uh, get, especially the leg muscles working. Uh, obviously it's hard work and uh, thank God I didn't stick to my flip-flops. I don't think there's any way you could do this without the Wellington boots and the leech socks. Anyway, a bit dehydrated, looking forward to some nice lunch now and a lemonade. Tell me about uh, your walk this morning. How much did you enjoy it? Ah, uh, really, really good. I love finding different things within the forest ground. Hunting, found the worms. I'm not sure what their scientific name is, but found those. That was pretty cool. Lots of fungi and stuff growing was on the trees. Generally just listened to the bird sounds. Didn't see too many, but that's okay. Could hear them. And also just the trees, the variety of trees within the jungle itself and vines, as well as uh, just the silence of being in there yeah great I could do it every day so I should explain whilst I'm bobbing around in the dinghy by the police uh, pontoon we are having a little beach party tonight uh, it's 15 miles away around the corner on the coast looks like uh, Lindsay and Jason have struck lucky they've got the young ladies it's a big smile there Lindsay How come you didn't get the young girls, Roy? I knocked them back. <laughs> We're going to take it easy tonight and uh, have a couple of beers. And tomorrow we've got a big fuel run to do. How exciting! <laughs> quite good actually because uh, you probably saw the cloud there but actually that's I think an easterly another easterly has come through it's quite a bit of wind but it's on the nose because we're, we're kind of pointing east east southeast I suppose just to get out of the bay and then we'll turn round might be able to get the sails up don't know but I think by the time we get out of here we're already halfway through our journey because it is literally 15 miles away anyway lots of 
excited young Malaysians on board the boats and uh, a few girls dressed up to the nines in their six inch heels and Santorini doing about 24 knots. get a little bit of sailing in. We've got ZZ right next to us at the moment. We're letting them overtake us. Um, they're going to go across us in a moment and then we're going to turn the corner and head down the bay with that wind. Maybe a beam reach, maybe a broad reach. We'll find out in a minute. Well, there goes Roy and Lily in Chaska with their two guests on board. Roy is very good on the old coal rigs, being a salty old dog. But he did just say he's had so much to do uh, leaving here, he left his anchor ball up. What did they say? We got round the corner. The wind angle changed and we're able to get the Kraken out, that's our code zero. And we've just turned the engine off and we've got about four and a half to five knots. Five and a half, we've got five and a half knots. Yoo-hoo! Only about an hour and a half to go. If we get there at 5.30, it's fine. Don't mind being last if it means we can sail this short passage to the beach party that's supposed to be happening tonight. So just enjoying it while we can with the Kraken. So here we go, there's Esper now. Esper is uh, sailing its famous Kraken. They're, they're beautiful uh, custom-made sail by Phil Auger of Zoom Sails. So uh, they're doing very well. Looking bloody good actually. Yeah, that sail is a beauty. So we're accompanied by two of the uh, police gunboats, which is really comforting. The uh, Philippine Islands come to within 10 kilometers of the uh, Saba coastline in this part of the world. We would be a prize indeed for Abu Sayyaf. If you look in the distance behind Esper, you can see the big gunboat. It's seriously now, it's bristling with six machine guns on the upper deck. And uh, on the foredeck, they've got a cannon. So uh, we feel pretty good about this trip. The wind has now come round to the front, so we actually put the Kraken away just at the right time. There seems to be quite a bit of weather building up just over on the horizon, over on, on land over there, which the boats ahead are just about to steer into. So it was all good timing. But it looks pretty evil, actually. <laughs> We've arrived at uh, Payang Bay. There's Esper. She's looking for a spot to drop the anchor now. Here we are anchored in our next spot, 15 miles around the corner. It's a nice little spot, I have to say. Look, I mean, look at this great afternoon sun here. We're actually dropped in about 20 meters. Uh, there's a few reefs around. We've got a mini blue hole just over there, uh, but everyone seems pretty happy. And uh, the other boats are ferrying their guests over to land. Uh, we've got half an hour to slip in a quick beer. I was really keen for a dip, but I guess we've got time for that because we're going to be here for another three days or so. Um, so yeah, time for a quick beer, taking this sunset, and then it's party time. <laughs> 